This chapter, King of Diamonds, the story of Lou Gehrig. They called him Larraping Lou, the Iron Man of baseball. He set many enduring records, yet the record for which Lou Gehrig will always be remembered was his good sportsmanship and courage. No man ever needed courage more because to him, all things came the hard way. In 1903, Lou Gehrig was born in one of the poorer districts of New York City. In the slum streets, he learned to play baseball. He went to Chicago in 1919 to play in the Intercity High School Baseball Championships. Lou was 16, shy and awkward, but he hit a home run to win the game for his team. It was the kid's first taste of glory. Next year, he entered Columbia University, working his way through. Somehow, between odd jobs and study, he found time for athletics playing on the varsity football and baseball teams. Offered a contract by the New York Yankees, he left college for professional baseball. Lou reported to the Yankees for spring training 1925. They were a great team. Could the timid rookie make his place among stars like pitcher Wait Hoyt and slugger Babe Ruth? He had a lot to learn about playing his position first base but he was a natural hitter. When spring training ended, he stayed with the team, substitute first baseman. You were a Yankee wearing the proudest uniform in baseball. But the regulars were too good. Week after week, you sat on the bench waiting for a break. One day, the chance came. You were sent in by manager Miller Huggins. From that day on, you were the regular first baseman. In the beginning, your fielding left a lot to be desired. But you learned quickly, never made the same mistake twice. About your batting, there was never any doubt. Those big shoulders packed a tremendous wallop. Soon, you were established with the great sluggers of all time. With Tris Speaker, Ty Cobb, and Babe Ruth. You and Ruth, the home run twins. So fame came to a lad from New York's crowded streets and tenements. Your autograph was in demand. But the real hero of the fans, young and old, was the mighty Babe Ruth. His swashbuckling personality drew the crowds to the stadium. He was the greatest of the sluggers. When Ruth was on the field, Gehrig was pushed into the background. While the Bambino was in his prime, he was the undisputed king of baseball. Gehrig was crown prince. It seemed that Lou Gehrig would go through his career in the shadow of the Bambino, destined always to play second fiddle to Babe Ruth. Spring training, 1932. Seven eventful years had passed since Lou Gehrig became a Yankee. In slow motion, he demonstrated the powerful back and shoulders that hammered out the home runs. As a hitter, he was second only to Babe Ruth. He had learned to field, became a great first baseman. Yet he hadn't achieved the fame he deserved, robbed of glory by queer quirks of fate. One June day in Philadelphia, Lou hit three home runs. The manager of the athletics, Connie Mack, wasn't going to let him hit another. But Gehrig did it, hit four home runs in one day. He should have been a hero. But that day, John J. McGraw resigned as manager of the New York Giants. In the excitement, Gehrig's feet passed almost unnoticed. Lou preferred it that way. He went on to play in 2,000 consecutive ball games, setting a new world record. That called for a celebration at which Bashful Lou was commended by the new Yankee manager, Joe McCarthy. Lou, I want to congratulate you on uh, your wonderful career and playing 2,000 games 
without missing a game. And I hope I'm around here when you play your next 2,000. Thank you very You've much. You've a wonderful sir. job, and you should be congratulated, and, uh, and I'm sure that you're going to continue for a long time to come. Thank you, Joe. That was a great moment in Garrick's life. An even happier moment, his marriage to Eleanor Twitchell in 1933. Always shy with girls, it took Lou four years to propose. Marriage inspired Garrick. The following season was the best of his career. Only one cause for regret that year was Babe Ruth's last with the Yankees. Spring training, 1935. You had been made captain of the Yankees. With Babe Ruth gone, friends advised you to assert yourself and step into the limelight. It was out of character, but you tried. When the season began, the fans saw a new Lou Gehrig. In the past, you had accepted the decisions of umpires as law. But now, on questionable decisions, you argued fiercely with the umpires. The fans wanted their heroes glamorous. So you did your best to conform. Taking a screen test, you starred in a Hollywood picture. Joining an organization of celebrities, the saints and sinners, you clown through the initiation. An authentic celebrity by now, you still found it hard to act a part. So you decided to stop trying. Let others seek the spotlight. You'd be satisfied to go on playing big league baseball. In 1936-49, home runs, a great season. In 1937-37, home runs, not quite as good. In 1938-29, home runs, you were slipping. Almost as soon as the season of 1939 began, you knew something was wrong. Days would pass without a hit. You were getting boos from the fans. Your reflexes seemed to be out of kilter. You tightened your grip, tried to keep your eye on the ball. But there was little power in your swing, and it required a real effort to run the bases. You felt you were a handicap to the team, so you took yourself out of the regular lineup. After 13 years, your proud record of consecutive games was ended. The Mayo Clinic. You went to that famous medical center in mid-season for a physical checkup. You joked with the nurses, certain that nothing serious could be the matter. You expected to be back with the Yankees in a few days. The doctors were far from optimistic. They put you through a series of stiff laboratory tests. Their verdict, a death sentence. You had a rare and fatal form of infantile paralysis. Only a few years left. July 4th, 1939, one of the saddest days in the history of baseball. Lou Gehrig had come to Yankee Stadium to say goodbye. With him, stunned by the tragedy, were stars of Yankee teams of the past, all the old comrades, here to honor a man who had honored baseball more than any other player. From Babe Ruth, the embrace of an old friend, while Mrs. Gehrig watched from the stands. From Ed Barrow, business manager of the Yankees, words of support. Gehrig needed them. It was all he could do to keep from sobbing. No tears. Keep it light and cheerful. The fans waited for Lou to speak. But what was there to say? Today, Today. I consider, I consider myself, myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face, on the of, the face of the earth. He'd kept it cheerful. Now, goodbye to Yankee Stadium. Garrig refused to mark time to the end. He took a position on the New York City Parole Board, sworn in by Mayor LaGuardia. He would devote his last years to men who were, in his words, less fortunate than himself. He studied hard for the new job. 
but the illness was taking its course. Lou became too weak to go to the office. Gehrig passed away in 1941. Flags flew at half-mast as the nation mourned. In Yankee Stadium, where he had thrilled baseball fans for so many years, a monument was erected in his memory. The bashful man who shunned the spotlight had become immortal. In Yankee Stadium, he had won his nickname, Larraping Lou Gehrig. His hitting exploits make a shining page in the record books. They called him the Iron Horse, and his record of consecutive games played may stand forever. Although Lou Gehrig never strove for fame, in the end he became King of Diamonds.